Hey, my name is Abbas. I'm a research fellow here at the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. We're just about to start our next session. Uh, this is on technology globalization and the need for a new model of development. Uh, so the rise in technology around the world in the form of artificial intelligence, social media, augmented reality, um, and so on and so forth, has increasingly seems to be posing certain dilemmas or trilemmas, as uh, Professor Roderick would put it, and I'm sure we'll get into that in just a bit, uh, around the world. And this has led to a breakdown in democracy at several levels uh, and triggered the rise of sort of reactionary populist leaders around the world. It's almost as if our conceptualization of interconnectedness has failed to keep up with emerging trends and innovations around the world. And uh, it seems like we're stuck in these sort of old ways of uh, sort of conventional industrialization based on steel and cars and so on and so forth. And so this panel aims to address these concerns, laying the groundwork for a new approach to development and globalization, which is based on inclusivity, uh, dynamism, and proactivity. Our panelist for, the, for this discussion is going to be Professor Danny Roderick, who holds a PhD in economics and an MPA from Princeton, as well as an AB from Harvard College. His research focuses on globalization, economic growth and development, and political economy. Uh, Professor Roderick is also the author of the book, Straight Talk on Trade Ideas for a Sane World Economy. His articles have been published in several research papers, um, including the American Economic Review and Journal of Political Economy. He's also a, a columnist for Project Syndicate. Um, our chairperson for this is going to be our very own uh, Vice Chancellor Pied, Dr. Nandim al uh, He's also served as the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission from 20, uh, 2010 to 2013, worked for the IMF for 24 years, focusing on uh, public structure reform in Sri Lanka. He also has five books to his name. So with that, I'd like to pass over the floor to Dr. Nandim to begin this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abbas. Welcome, Professor Danny Roderick. Uh, obviously, you're very well known in Pakistan. And obviously, you're even more welcome because you're Turkish. And you know, Pakistan and Turkey have a very special relationship. So we're very happy to have you here. And of course, you're the, one of the leading economists in the world. And we all have read a lot about you and your household word in Pakistan. Everybody's looking forward to your lecture, which obviously is going to break new ground. Uh, let me tell you very briefly that we in this conference are targeting opportunity. The title is Opportunity to Excel Now in the Future. And we've had some interesting discussions. Today is the first day, or I should say second day, because we had half an evening yesterday, but today is the first day really. So we had some interesting discussions. There's lots of students here. There's about 500 students ready to listen to you. And these students are all trying to understand what technology globalization means for them. So with that, let me turn the floor over to you. Everybody is eager to listen to you and not to me. So over to you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadim. Uh, good evening um, uh, to all of you. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be able uh, to join uh, this conference, uh, albeit uh, remotely. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of uh, these, uh, these, these proceedings. Um, I want to um, thank the um, Pakistan Society of Development Economists and the Pakistan Institute for Development Economics. Um, and I'm very happy to report as the current uh, president of the International Economic Association that the uh, President, uh, the um, uh, Pakistan Institute for Development uh, Economics has just recently um, become a member of the International uh, Economic Association. Um, so that makes me uh, doubly um, um, happy for for being part of um, these uh, these these proceedings. Um, I, what I'm going to be uh, talking about um, is, is is very much uh, in line, I think, with the general theme. Uh, of this um, of this conference, um, I'm going to be focusing on um, uh, the transformations um, in uh, in the current global uh, context uh, that I think um, make us 
uh, that that force us uh, to think uh, about um, a, a new development uh, model. Um, I'm not going to be talking specifically uh, about uh, Pakistan, uh, although um, I do think that that uh, many of the challenges that that Pakistan faces, uh, including uh, the need to create opportunity for young people. Um, is, is one of the central challenges of this country. And, and I think um, uh, what I will have to say, I think relates to that central issue. Um, let, me, let me start by um, uh, talking about um, what the traditional development model is and why that is no longer working. I think in the back of our minds as, as economists, as development economists, economic historians, um, we have a, a standard model of structural uh, transformation um, so that if we divide up uh, the economy first, um, sort of uh, on a sectoral basis, um, agriculture, manufacturing services, and then we think um, as in the, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the traditional, in the, in the standard um, Lewis uh, terms of, of uh, some, some activities, economic activities being modern, others being traditional. Um, we can think of them as a distinction between informality and organized, but it might, might as well have been uh, formal versus, I mean, uh, traditional versus modern. We have a, a, a central story that, that um, development usually happens uh, by moving resources, uh, labor in particular, uh, from uh, the countryside, traditional agriculture, low productivity, informal agriculture, um, to um, industry uh, in urban occupations uh, that are more formal, more organized, higher productivity. And in the course of that transformation, the economy actually uh, experiences significant increase in overall productivity because generally labor productivity in, in, in manufacturing and related services um, is, is much higher than traditional agriculture. And that's the, really the engine of growth, uh, this, sort of, this model of industrialization. Um, now I'll say a little bit more later on as to why industrialization per se has been such a potent uh, engine for growth, uh, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that uh, at the end of my um, of my uh, uh, remarks when we talk about, when I talk about what might be the alternatives. Uh, and then sort of later on, so what the second arrow here uh, uh, shows is that later on, of course, we have once a certain maturity has been reached in the economy, um, there is uh, a movement towards services, the tertiary sector expands, there is a kind of a process of deindustrialization, but this deindustrialization happens at relatively late stages of development after a certain maturity in the economy um, has been reached. Now, of course, that deindustrialization brings its own problems, uh, but that's not a challenge for development per se. What is happening in uh, most uh, developing countries um, today is actually very, very different. Um, it's no longer the standard industrialization model. It's no longer kind of industrialization that even post-war miracle economies like uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, more recently China, perhaps Vietnam have been experiencing. Um, but it's, it's a kind of a very, very weak uh, process of industrialization. In fact, in many countries, a process of deindustrialization. Um, it, it's not that uh, workers or, or, or farmers are not leaving the countryside. There is still a process of urbanization. People are still coming into urban areas. Uh, but typically, um, that, that movement is into uh, petty services or informal services, as indicated by the thickest of the arrows in this chart. Um, so the process of urbanization is not necessarily associated with significant increases in productivity because these uh, informal services are um, not just precarious, but also relatively low productivity. Um, uh, moreover, uh, even to the extent that there is um, manufacturing growth, industrialization, the bulk of it actually happens to be not necessarily in the formal, organized, more productive parts of manufacturing, but uh, much more in the sort of small scale, low technology, uh, less productive, informal parts um, of manufacturing. Uh, 
So in other words, um, the two key trends that undermine the traditional uh, model of, of, of development is one, uh, something that, that uh, can be termed a process of premature deindustrialization. That is that many countries, relatively low income countries, are experiencing employment deindustrialization much earlier during the development process before they reach a certain level of maturity. And secondly, um, uh, even when there is growth in manufacturing, it tends to be dominated by informality rather than uh, the type of formal organized manufacturing, which is much more likely to ex exhibit productivity convergence. So let me go into a little bit more detail with some country examples to really um, exemplify um, this, 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 dif you know, this difference between the traditional versus the current patterns of structural change. Um, so here is, for example, the um, you know, two relatively sort of um, uh, two East Asian examples of uh, the traditional manufacturing led growth process. Um, and here, uh, what I've shown here is um, employment, total employment in manufacturing, uh, breaking down the um, employment growth uh, uh, into formal and informal uh, employment. Um, in both cases, you see during the rapid growth phases, you see um, a rather um, a sharp rise in, in manufacturing employment. Um, in Taiwan during the uh, 60s and 70s uh, in particular, in, in, in Vietnam more recently after the mid 1990s. Uh, but the key thing is that I want to draw your attention to is that sort of these are successful industrializers. Um, and the key thing um, is that also formal employment, the rise of formal employment, you know, sort of organized factories, um, uh, uh, um, middle, medium to large scale um, uh, factories, um, the formal employment has, has kept pretty close track uh, with the rise of formal, uh, of total employment. That is to say, um, you know, the, the rise in manufacturing employment has been driven by the rise in formal employment rather than the rise of informal employment. Now let's turn to um, two of uh, sort of two more recent cases of low income countries in sub-Saharan Africa um, uh, that have some experience recently with industrialization. These two countries are Ethiopia and Tanzania. Uh, now Tanzania has not been as successful as Ethiopia um, and Ethiopia's success I think is also debatable, but Ethiopia is certainly a country that has uh, had a significant increase in manufacturing employment over the last couple of decades, uh, with the you know share of manufacturing employment um, rising by nearly 10 percentage points. Um, so, if you're looking for relative success in industrialization, uh, you would certainly look at a country um, like Ethiopia in the sub in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but what's really striking here is is how different the pattern of employment uh, within manufacturing is. Uh, which is that it's been driven largely uh, by increases in informal employment in manufacturing, whereas formal employment has remained rather stagnant. And the pattern is very much the same in Tanzania as well. And that's a general finding uh, in the most recent literature that even countries that are able to avoid uh, premature deindustrialization in the low income world uh, um, that uh, is largely due uh, to patterns of informal employment, and that if you simply look at formal employment, um, that that uh, uh, that there is widespread um, uh, continued premature deindustrialization even in countries of sub-Saharan Africa, such as Ethiopia and and, and Tanzania. Um, why is this happening? Um, in a in a in a recent paper. Um, with a number of co-authors, um, I've looked more in more detailed fashion um, in uh, th these two cases of Ethiopia and Tanzania. Um, and what's really stands out in a very striking fashion is how dualistic uh, the pattern of employment and productivity is within manufacturing. Now, in the context of development economics, we're of course um, used to dualism, but really what's interesting here is a dualism within a sector that we actually normally consider to be a modern high productivity sector, which is sort of, which is the manufacturing sector. And this dualism exhibits itself in a very important uh, dichotomy uh, that um, 
that employment growth within manufacturing uh, is concentrated really in the smallest firms, in the informal firms, uh, with the worst productivity performance, whereas productivity growth uh, is actually concentrated in the large firms, uh, which, however, don't tend to absorb a lot of workers. So in short, large firms actually have pretty good productivity performance, but little employment growth, whereas small firms are the ones that absorb employment, but they in turn exhibit very productivity performance. So this dichotomy in terms of, you know, either you can be productive uh, or you can absorb employment, but not both at the same time. And I think this pattern of, uh, um, uh, of, of manufacturing dualism uh, is, is very worrying because we want, as in the standard East Asian model or sort of the standard development model, we want precisely the higher productivity or high productivity growth manufacturing firms to be expanding and also absorbing employment. And that does not seem to be happening. Why is this the case? Um, we can talk about a number of different features. And in fact, you know, the standard explanations of um, dualism in developing countries or in, or in Africa in terms of a variety of market and government failures, um, uh, relatively high labor costs, perhaps uh, um, restrictions on firms entry and exit, uh, perhaps a poor business environment, uh, perhaps levels of corruption and so forth, don't fully explain this dichotomy. Uh, so for example, the puzzle isn't that uh, there isn't good productivity performance. There is a segment of firms, the large uh, firms that are in fact exhibiting good productivity performance. The puzzle is that they're not at the same time uh, absorbing employment. Well, you might say, well, maybe it's because of high labor costs, but when you look at actual labor costs and the labor share of value added in these firms is extremely, extremely low. Um, and, 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 and suggesting that the story in terms of high labor costs is very unlikely uh, to be the story. Um, it, where um, we have uh, honed in uh, in this uh, paper on Tanzania and Ethiopia that I, I just mentioned, and I think points to a, a more general um, uh, feature of the current development context uh, is essentially uh, the excessively capital intensity, excessively capital intensive mode of production uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the firms that are actually doing well from a productivity standpoint. Um, now in a way, in some ways that is not very surprising because one of the ways in which you increase labor productivity is through capital deepening. Uh, but uh, in a labor abundant country that cannot be the full story or there have to be limits to that, um, and that you would expect that the increases would come through TFP and would not be simply capital deepening. And moreover, the capital deepening has to be held in check if, um, uh, in view of uh, relative factor prices. However, when we look at the scale of capital intensity uh, in countries like uh, Ethiopia and Tanzania for these most productive firms, we find that the capital intensity is actually very comparable uh, to capital intensity of firms in a country like uh, the Czech Republic, uh, which is essentially is 10 times as rich, uh, as much, you know, 10 times as uh, um, you know, more capital abundant um, than, than these countries. So there is something off here that is that, you know, that it looks like these productive firms are essentially uh, using um, the same production techniques as in countries that are much more capital abundant um, than them. And, and that sort of is not what we would expect from standard um, uh, trade theory or production theory, given that factor prices and the relative factor abundances are so different across uh, a country like Ethiopia versus the Czech Republic. Um, so when we dig deeper, um, it's, um, it's, it's a variety of things come out. It's, it's, um, um, uh, you know, so the, the main point is that capital intensity in the most productive firms and the largest firms are much higher than would, would be expected based on these countries' relative labor abundance and very low per capita income levels. Um, interestingly, exporting firms or the traditionally labor-intensive textiles and clothing firms do not exhibit lower capital labor ratios 
than other manufacturing firms on average. So it's not like you're specializing on those um, uh, uh, sectors where in fact there is um, um, lower capital intensity as standard trade theory would lead you to predict. And, and furthermore, if you look over time, we also find that capital labor ratios have increased much more rapidly in Tanzania and Ethiopia in manufacturing than in the economy as a whole. So there is much greater capital deepening happening there. Now, um, I would like to argue that what we're observing uh, in these countries in terms of technology choice, particularly um, with these um, larger firms, is essentially a consequence of a global technological change that um, uh, that there has been production in manufacturing um, has progressively become more capital intensive and much less intensive in low educated to low skilled labor. And that essentially to larger firms in these countries um, that feel like um, they can compete or they have to compete uh, with global firms are increasingly uh, forced to employ technologies uh, that are very, very capital and by implication, very skill intensive, um, uh, but however, uh, is really inappropriate from the standpoint of um, the uh, abundance of low skill labor in those countries. So let me sort of unpack that argument. First, the, the global trends. Of course, we know that globally, um, the uh, uh, technological change in manufacturing has been very sort of intensive, very biased against low skilled labor. Um, so if we look at um, the labor intensity of production or, or the uh, incidence of em employment by different skill groups in manufacturing, uh, breaking up uh, labor into three different skill groups, low, intermediate and high, uh, essentially um, the entire decline in the employment uh, share in value added uh, in manufacturing is accounted for by uh, the decline in the share of low skilled labor. Um, and that's of significant consequence for developing countries uh, to the extent that this is a global technological trend and the advanced countries are the source of technology for low income countries. That means that essentially the technological changes are biased against the factor of production, low skilled labor, low edu educated labor, which is the one where low income countries are the most abundant in. So it's particularly biased uh, against um, the um, uh, advantages, uh, comparative advantage of the, um, of, the, of, the, of low income countries. So let me, with that sort of, you know, technological, global technological trend in the background, um, let me just highlight very quickly a kind of um, the analytics of what I think is going on uh, that might explain this kind of, of, of um, industrial manufacturing dualism and the consequences for employment. So uh, let's begin uh, with a situation. And now suppose we're looking at a country like Ethiopia. Um, we have, um, um, let's begin with the assumption that firms in this country have access uh, initially to two kinds of technologies. Uh, one of them is labor intensive and the other is uh, capital intensive. So I've, I've drawn the, uh, the, um, the cost curves for these two uh, types of uh, technologies, the capital intensive technology and the labor intensive technology um, uh, in this chart. Um, and um, uh, let's suppose um, that the world price that these firms are facing um, are um, uh, at is initially P0. Uh, that's the world price at which they have to compete either on world markets or in their home markets um, against uh, firms from other countries. Now, the way that I've drawn this initial situation, costs with the labor intensive technology are much lower um, and therefore, which is in line with these uh, countries, uh, essentially, you know, abundance in low skilled labor. Um, so it stands to reason that in this equilibrium, um, uh, developing country firms are going to choose the labor intensive te technology. Uh, so they will disproportionately employ the labor intensive technology and they will produce um, output Q0 at world price uh, P0. So that's our initial equilibrium. 
in some sense, a happy equilibrium because developing countries are using a labor intensive technology. Now, let's uh, then move the uh, film forward um, and assume that what's now happening is the kind of process I just described in the previous slide, which is that there is a process of global technological innovation, but that global technological innovation uh, is biased against low skilled labor. Uh, that is that uh, it essentially um, is um, uh, is very skill and capital intensive. So one way to represent this in terms of this chart is to say that what is happening is that global technologic innovation uh, pushes costs of production down um, uh, for uh, only for the capital intensive technology. Um, and that therefore the, the, the cost curve for the labor intensive technology stays the same, but the cost curve for the capital intensive technology has shifted down. And so we have this shift down in the, into the new uh, cost curve, uh, which is a dashed line curve for the capital intensive technology. Now, what is that going to happen? What's, going, what's, what's that going to do for, for, uh, in, 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 uh, for world markets? Uh, what that does is that essentially because uh, advanced countries were using the more capital intensive technology now with their costs coming down, uh, global prices are going to fall uh, to a level like P1. Um, but the downward shift in cost for the capital intensive technology in developing countries is going to be less than this downward shift in world prices. Uh, um, and that's either because uh, capital costs are higher in the low income country or because there might be you know, technological uh, uh, frictions in the, in the transfer of technology from advanced countries. So the way that I've drawn this downward shift in the capital intensive technology from the perspective of the low income country is that this downward shift in the cost curve uh, is actually lower than the downward shift in world prices. Okay, so that's the new equilibrium. So now the question is uh, what now the developing countries, the firms in developing countries uh, face a choice uh, of which, time, which type of technology uh, to adopt. Uh, um, and uh, the way that the cost curves have shifted down here and world prices have shifted, you will notice that the new world price P1 is actually everywhere lower than the costs for the labor intensive technology. So continuing with the labor intensive technology, if you're going to compete in the world markets or with foreign firms is no longer viable. So you cannot use the labor intensive technology anymore. And now you're forced to shift to the capital intensive technology. And therefore, um, uh, essentially, uh, what happens is that uh, with, the new, with the new technological uh, possibilities, with a lower world price P1, uh, the uh, firms in the developing countries are now producing at Q1, a lower output Q1. Okay, so what is the main story here? The main story here really is that when you look at sort of the consequences of this kind of biased technological change on what it does to employment possibilities, uh, in this uh, prototypical developing country is that there is essentially a triple whammy or a triple negative shock on employment prospects. Uh, one is that there is a direct employment loss due to the reduction in output. Uh, so output goes from Q0 to Q1, there is a reduction in output. Uh, why is output lower? Well, because essentially the, the, the change in, 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 in technology um, is has reduced to the comparative advantage that developing countries had in, in labor intensive product. So this is a reduction in comparative advantage. Um, and therefore, this is an adverse, um, essentially, terms of trade shock, and that reduces the output of manufacturing. That's, and then that's the direct employment loss due to reduction in output. Now, there is an additional shift, of course, because not only is output been reduced, but the, that the production technique also has become more capital intensive. And therefore there's an additional shock to employment, which is that you know, given the reduction in output, there's a, multi, there's a multiplied, there's a, there's a kind of employment you know, is reduced by proportionately by more uh, because capital has become also, because output also has become more uh, uh, capital intensive. And third, uh, there is also kind of a more dynamic effect, if you will, uh, which is that there is going to be a reduction in employment elasticity 
uh, in this economy to positive profitability shocks. Uh, because essentially what the um, uh, production structure now implies, at least for these uh, sort of more competitive firms, is going to be they have a, a steeper cost curve. There's a steeper cost curve because capital is and the various um, complements to capital, such as skills and infrastructure and so forth, are much more scarce in the low income countries. So that there is a that this cost curve rises more steeply in lo, in the low income country compared to before, and so what that means is that the buoyancy of employment, uh, the dynamism of employment, uh, when countries are doing everything right or there are positive profitability shocks to employment, uh, that buoyancy or the employment elasticity is also going to be um, uh, lower. So this, these are the the the, 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 the triple. Uh, negative shocks uh, to employment prospects. And this is sort of, I think, the, the way that I think of the analytics behind uh, what's happening in a lot of countries, which is that the only way that um, firms can actually compete with more productive uh, um, firms in the rest of the world is by adopting technologies that are much more like those that those foreign firms have adopted, but those are capital and skill intensive technologies and therefore, you can only become more productive by essentially reducing your ability to absorb employment, whereas um, essentially the surplus of employment ends up much more sort of in informal firms that are not necessarily competitive um, with, with, with foreign firms. And so that's the, um, that's the, um, that's the story um, I think that a lot of uh, developing countries are facing and why the prospects for uh, industrialization-driven growth has become uh, much uh, weaker um, across the world for developing countries. So that, I think, raises the question, if this is the conundrum uh, that industrialization now poses, uh, that even those countries that are going to be successful are those that will not be able to absorb significant amounts of employment, that manufacturing will look more like, if you will, enclave sectors. Maybe you'll have, you know, you'll manage to plug in into global value chains here and there, but they'll essentially remain enclaves in your economy and not produce the kind of, of, of uh, trickle down and expanded employment, expanded, expanded productive um, opportunities for large parts of, of your labor force. Then the question is, what is the alternative to um, to uh, the standard model. To, to see whether there are really alternatives elsewhere, I think we need to dig a little bit deeper on the question of um, why industrialization has historically been such a potent force, such a potent engine for rapid growth in the first place. I think there is there are three reasons. Um, which was implicit in a lot of what I said before, but I think it's, it's useful to, to be explicit about that. One is the, the process of productivity dynamics, that historically there has been unconditional convergence in formal organized manufacturing, which is to say that once you get your manufacturing uh, started, there is a process of convergence uh, to the uh, productivity frontier. So the productivity dynamics in manufacturing have tended to look very different than in other parts. Uh, so that's a process of unconditional convergence. But it's not just that, but there's also two other things. One is that traditionally manufacturing has had the ability to absorb a lot of you know, labor. So you could turn a, um, um, a, uh, a, a farmer uh, into a production worker in manufacturing uh, relatively easily uh, so that there were few constraints on the supply side to expanding manufacturing production because you could reply, you could rely on a sort of reserve army of, of um, you know, relatively less productively employed workers. And third, that there was no constraint on the demand side either, that you know, once you got manufacturing going, you were not constrained by the size of your home market, uh, that you can expand uh, by excelling export a, a, a abroad uh, or replacing uh, in, uh, imports in your home market without necessarily term in, turning the terms of trade against yourself and running into the problem of, of reduced profitability. So that 
number two and number three imply that you could expand manufacturing without running into either supply side constraints or demand side constraints. Now, the story I've told you is, um, is that basically um, number two is no longer there. Uh, so manufacturing has essentially lost its ability to absorb labor. But the point is that if we're going to uh, look for alternatives, uh, you know, those alternatives would have to have these three characteristics, that they would have to have the, uh, the productivity dynamics, uh, they would have to have the labor absorption capacity, and they would have to have um, uh, trade, to, you know, the tradeability that allows um, um, the absence of, of, of constraints uh, on the demand side. So when we look at you know, what those alternatives might be, and they would be in agriculture or in services necessarily, uh, um, the question is whether we can find um, such alternatives. Now, my general conclusion here uh, is that in fact, uh, well, there are certainly significant um, productivity, uh, uh, so significant opportunities for productivity increase uh, in agriculture and in services. Uh, that it's very difficult to identify the kind of, you know, you know, part of the economy, kind of sector that might actually fulfill the historical role that um, manufacturing um, has traditionally uh, done. Uh, because in terms of agriculture, it's very difficult to envisage a world or a future world in which agriculture will continue to absorb employment. So there's a lot of you know, you know, improvements one can do and diversification into non-traditional products and so forth. There's a lot of potential there, but even in countries that have done that job well by developing um, cash crops or developing non-traditional exports, uh, labor has continued to move out of, out of agriculture. So agriculture is not going to be a labor absorbing sector. Um, what about services? Well, services will certainly absorb labor, but the question is what kind of services will absorb labor? Um, crudely speaking, I think services come in two varieties. Uh, there is a high productivity and generally tradable seg segment, um, and those are things like IT, finance, insurance, business services, um, you know, uh, business processing, outsourcing, and all of those kinds of things, uh, which have the right technological characteristics, they have the right productivity dynamics, they're also tradable. Um, but the problem is that they're very, very skill intensive. Um, so in other words, they are not in line uh, with the factor endowment structure of most developing countries and even countries like India and the Philippines, which have been very successful um, uh, in developing IT services or, or, or business process outsourcing. Um, that, um, uh, that uh, you know, those sectors have remained relatively limited in terms of their overall impact on economic development because they are not the answer to the 95% you know, of the uh, labor force uh, which, which, which do not have the skills to be absorbed into those IT or BPO uh, sectors. The rest of the services are essentially uh, where labor goes currently, and these are relatively non low productivity, non-tradable services that cannot act as growth poles precisely because they're not tradable. And therefore, even if you're able to increase productivity, eventually, uh, you know, they will run into sort of, you know, uh, demand side constraints. So they're not going to be the kind of, they're not going to be as potent an engine for growth um, as, um, as, um, um, as, as, um, as tradable uh, services or, or tradable manufacturing can be. So that's really, I think, leaves us uh, with a conundrum. And that's the conundrum is, you know, where will the good jobs, where will the productive jobs really come from? Um, and, uh, you know, those were traditionally spearheaded uh, by manufacturing, but I think they're going to be increasingly, uh, um, uh, you know, will have to be produced by more sort of domestic services. And I think when you think about the implication of, of that, I think um, that more and more uh, it leaves us, it, it, it sort of drives, uh, drives us down a path where, um, uh, you know, two traditionally distinct modes of policy, that is on the one hand growth policy, and on the other social policy really become more and more like uh, one and the same. Um, so in other words, growth policy and social policy 
may increasingly have become one and the same to the extent that that on the one hand you cannot have growth without creating pro productive jobs and expanding sort of the middle class and in that sense you know growth policy has to be inclusive uh, and, 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 and play the you know, important function in uh, as social policy. Um, on the other hand, we cannot really address you know, the structural factors behind poverty and inequality without creating good jobs for relatively low skilled workers. So in other words, you, know, you can't really do good social policy without, in terms of using the terms of this conference, without really providing employment opportunities, productive job opportunities. It can't be simply transfers. So that's the sense in which I think thinking about creating the right kinds of jobs for the bulk of relatively less skilled, low educated workers is the way both to provide for greater inclusion, more equitable development, better social policy, more better social outcomes, and also the way to get more growth by getting people into more productive jobs. So that means essentially that, that you know, working on the two sides of the labor market, both the, the workers themselves increasing their skills and so forth, but also on the other side, which is that to have good jobs, you also need to have good firms. And that will mean sort of working uh, with uh, small and medium sized enterprises to enhance their capabilities. Um, so that will, I think, ultimately entail a mixture of interventions, both on the supply and demand um, side uh, uh, sides of the um, uh, of, of markets. And I think the nature of productive development policy or industrial development policy uh, really changes because we normally think uh, about industrial policy um, as essentially being focusing on the growth champions, the, the sort of the, the most productive larger firms, the ones that are oriented towards the world market and so forth. But if what I'm arguing is right, that those parts of the economy are actually going to have only limited success in creating opportunities, in creating employment for the bulk of the workforce, um, then, um, then, uh, then industrial policies will have to focus much more on the sort of the small and medium sized segment of firms, more on firms that are really producing for the home market. Um, and, uh, and that's really a very, very different style of, of uh, both industrial policy and for development policy. So uh, just, you know, to just to use maybe two or three more minutes uh, to uh, explain how exactly I think what that sort of model looked like. Um, let me try to uh, wrap up by using um, this matrix, which um, I found useful in a, to, uh, to uh, in a variety of contexts, but I'm going to use it in the context of what, you know, so the implications of my argument so far are for development policy. So this, um, this matrix uh, differentiates um, along the columns on sort of, you know, what part of the economy we're intervening in, where we're intervening in the pre-production stage, that is at the stage where individuals are acquiring their education, their endowments, uh, the production stage, the stage at which production, employment, investment decisions are made, and the post-production stage, that is after those decisions have been made, and along the rows, uh, we distinguish between between sort of different uh, segments of the economy, low productivity, middle productivity, and high productivity segments of the economy. Now, our traditional sort of pro poverty reduction and social protection model uh, really focuses largely on the cells that I have circled here. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, this model focuses on investments in education, training, maybe also human capital. Uh, these are all sort of focused on, on enhancing the endowments with which uh, workers come to the market, uh, but also sort of post-production uh, redistribution uh, through uh, cash transfers, uh, through various safety nets and social protection schemes, and also about maybe about sort of macroeconomic policies directed at, um, uh, at, at, at full employment as well. So that's the traditional poverty reduction and social protection model. Now, the traditional industrial growth policies focus, uh, focus on a very different uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, kind of cells in, in, in terms of here. Um, on the one hand, we focus on things like the, you know, the right innovation systems, uh, the intellectual property rights regime, the trade agreements, uh, the R&D incentives, uh, subsidies, um, 
uh, you know, corporate tax incentives uh, to to uh, attract in, in investors from somewhere else and so forth. But it's really we're focusing much more on the high productivity the, uh, segment of the economy. Um, I think what um, we need to think increasingly of, um, and that's where I was um, I was I was coming at in my remarks just now, and and this you know for lack of a better better term we might call so the good jobs development model, the one that focuses on development from the perspective of trying to answer the question, where will the good productive jobs come from? And I think they're going to come increasingly from this sort of middle productivity segment, ideally. Uh, so these are not the most productive, the most competitive parts of the economy. They're not sort of the tradable manufacturing and services, um, uh, which because of the nature of technology, are increasingly skill and capital intensive and cannot generate the good jobs, um, uh, or can, can generate good jobs, but you do generate very few of them and not for the right kind of workers. So increasingly, I think we will need to have a focus um, that um, uh, is much more focused on firms uh, that are small and medium sized um, uh, about, um, and, and the nature, and, and these firms will be mostly domestically oriented, they'll be mostly services firms, and the nature of industrial policy, the way that we help these firms will actually uh, be um, very, very different. And, and we can maybe, I don't know how much time we'll have left to discuss, but um, the evidence we have on how we can enhance productivity and employment in, in this segment of firms is that we can, the best way to do it is not through tax incentives or subsidies necessarily, but through a variety of, of um, you know, training combined with uh, customized uh, public services that might range from, you know, uh, help with management, help with technology, help with marketing, um, uh, but very customized uh, set of, of provision of public inputs that are uh, contextual, that, that respond to the needs of different types of firms. Uh, it, 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 um, it, it's it's a kind of industrial policy, which I've written about in a number of, of, of different um, different settings, uh, but it's, it's very different from the traditional East Asian type of industrial policy that's focused on the export champions. Um, so uh, let me let me uh, just end here. Um, uh, even though I've I've suggest I've tried to suggest a direction for uh, where development policy uh, needs to move. I think this ra really raises many, many more questions that it answers, and I'm very much uh, conscious of that. Uh, but, but I'm very worried um, that our received models um, have broken down, um, and that uh, they're not, uh, they're going to uh, lead us um, uh, to uh, of increasing disappointment uh, with sort of um, our, our primary challenge of, of, of creating jobs for young people. Uh, in economies, particularly where uh, the um, labor force is, is growing uh, quite rapidly, um, and that, uh, uh, and, and of course, COVID, um, you know, these are challenges that are going to be even larger in a post-COVID world. Um, and I think um, if policymakers and economists don't confront these questions, um, I think um, we might have a bigger problem on our hands uh, than otherwise. So uh, I hope I have not uh, depressed you too much. I hope at least I've suggested some ways out of this dilemma. Uh, perhaps we're not going to have as rapid uh, growth as, as we had before the crisis, uh, but I think there are ways of thinking about growth that will also simultaneously make it more inclusive and, pro and produce better social outcomes for all. So it might be perhaps lower, but higher quality growth. So uh, thank you very much. And let me stop here. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was an excellent talk. And in some sense, you have set this very well for us because we in Pakistan are in the center of this debate. Um, first of all, let me say this is a great talk. You really set the issue very well for us. We've been discussing this today. And this is a larger debate that takes place in Pakistan. But let me also add that, Danny, we'd like something from you 
a kind of a paper because we want to publish a volume, so we'd like something for you, from you that we can present this to Pakistan. It's a very important point to present. Um, as I said, we've been discussing this. There is, um, we are kind of still stuck in the past because there's lots of talk on industrial policy. And there's industrial policy being made even as we speak. And it's the old industrial policy that you put in the last segment of your um, uh, table or your matrix that we are still thinking of subsidies, we are still thinking of uh, capital investments, and we are still focusing on trying to produce uh, the traditional capital intensive investment uh, through large firms. At the same time, we are still thinking of producing exports, so that's on the one side. We at the PID have begun to question this, and we've been arguing that technology is fast overtaking us, and this is why we are holding this conference. And we think that, quite frankly, we need to reimagine the economy. So we put forward a great growth framework, arguing that we should think much more broadly about technology as well as how investment will take place. So we need to give a much more broader focus to uh, the domestic market while we maintain openness. And we need to subset the issue of social policy, education policy, and other things. Uh, one of the key things that, uh, that, that comes out here very clearly is that should be focused just on exports and should be focused just on manufacturing and um, in terms of manufacturing we have a very traditional approach we think of buying machines as manufacturing so we are continuing to protect cars in pakistan we are continuing to protect fertilizers many industries in fact which are based on buying large machines we've just started protecting the manufacturing of mobile phones now, as you know these are all very shifting technology firms and quite frankly, one of the things that we are facing, which you highlight, is the fact that R&D is shifting capital intensity as well as services. Every area is being affected by R&D. And this is something that we don't participate in. We have no R&D whatsoever. In fact, we have zero R&D. We looked at that. And we cannot even compete in the R&D market. So in such an economy, of course, uh, you're very right. We are, like, we are more like Tanzania and Ethiopia than um, Vietnam or China. So what would your um, sort of advice be to a country like Pakistan? How do we frame this question? The other thing I might point out, we've also done some studies in, in, in PAID to look at regulation. What we've followed Cass Sunstein's uh, approach, and we call it sludge, and we started looking at our regulation, and we find that our regulation and the way the government intervenes in the market is a great impediment to growing uh, firms and a great impediment to getting out of informality. Um, so with those constraints, what would be your best advice um, to us actually beginning to frame our growth policy? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, uh, I, I mean, there's no way I can get very concrete in the context of, of Pakistan, um, given my, my very limited knowledge um, of the economy. But I think um, it, it, is a, it is a question of, of orientation and where government and um, bureaucratic resources are, um, are, are focused. Uh, I do think that um, a strategy, strategy that tries to turn Pakistan into um, a, a kind of um, a, a latter day China by trying to engineer uh, an export oriented industrialization model. I think the days for that are, are way past. Uh, I think um, uh, to, to try to turn um, Pakistan into an economy that um, you know, tries to uh, specialize in a lot of tradable services of like India or, or, or Philippines and trying to develop, you know, sort of industries, everything from call centers to BPO and, and IT. Uh, as, as, as a growth model, I don't think it's going to necessarily pay, pay off. Now, so those are emphases that I think are not going to, to pan out. It doesn't mean that there aren't things in the context of your trade regime or your industrial incentive regime or in the context of you know how those um, you know tradable services are treated that there's a whole bunch of regulations and regulatory environment and 
tariffs and taxes that couldn't be streamlined that could make things better off. So I'm sure there's a lot of reforms there that could be done. But my point is that in terms of saying what's the future of an economy like Pakistan, I don't see it uh, either in terms of uh, export oriented industrialization or in terms of developing um, sort of um, new capabilities in, in, in IT or, or in tradable um, uh, high end services or business uh, services. So that means that, that the, where I would put down the focus is on I think where the jobs will eventually be created. The jobs will be created largely uh, in domestic market oriented uh, services, um, uh, you know, retail services, personal services, health, uh, education, um, uh, wholesale, um, uh, you know, domestic transport, uh, you know, hospitality. Um, and that, you know, either will develop in a kind of a very haphazard, in, you know, with a lot of informality, very low productivity. Um, or it can develop in a way that actually uh, is much more uh, driven by productivity enhancements and strategic behavior on the part of the government collaborating with firms to provide the needed public inputs. So that means that essentially what I would do um, is, is look at the way that the both the local and the national governments um, are, have organized themselves at present in terms of how they serve the needs of these smaller and medium-sized enterprises and potential entrepreneurs. Um, so I'm sure there's a whole variety of, um, of services that are you know, targeting small, medium-sized enterprises. I'm sure there's a whole variety of, 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 of training um, uh, facilities. But the question is, you know, are those services being provided in a, in, a, in a rational way? Are they being provided in a way that adequately collaborates with um, uh, the producers and the firms themselves? Is there a process of learning and iterating so that things that work aren't repeated, but things that work you can do more of? Um, and uh, this is because it, it entails um, sort of collaborating with small and medium-sized enterprises, which, which is very, very, very large number. This is something that, you know, that the national government can perhaps set some ground rules on, but a lot of it will actually have to be done by local governments, by municipal governments. So I think the capacity of local governments to coordinate the services that are being provided for these local smaller and medium-sized enterprises is as, as important as what the national government uh, does. So I think thinking about sort of the municipal and local governments as uh, as 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 a, a kind of a set of experiments in uh, trying to provide these services and trying to promote uh, simultaneous employment increasing increasing productivity uh, um, uh, advances on the part of these smaller firms, for example, by you know setting up you know competitions for business plans um, um, and 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 and. Uh, and, and supporting uh, those business plans uh, that come with good ideas, uh, whether whether the support is, you know, uh, credit, whether the support is for you know marketing, whether supposed for you know technology, whether the support is some changes in regulations or red tape or something about zoning regulations, uh, but sort of putting in place mechanisms like these competitions for business plans um, and other sort of sectoral roundtables as a way of learning what those firms need and, and being able to in turn organize the local and national governments in a way that they can coordinate and provide those services. So I think I would ask the question, is the government set up, is setting itself up in a way that can actually perform this function? So well, that's really how I would begin to, to think about this problem. Lenny, that's a very tall order where I sit. I appreciate what you're saying, and it's very logical and it's very clear. But I also want you to reflect on this, that uh, our governments are kind of um, still sitting in the past. We have not done any, development economics has not focused on government reform at all. So in Tanzania, I was in Tanzania a few years ago, um, uh, from the IMF in technical assistance, I was in Nigeria. We have similar governments which are sitting in the 19th century colonial governments. We are not set up for the kind of competitive system that you're talking about. We are not set up to develop these complicated policies. We rely on, 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 on second-hand information that comes from the West and consultants that come through donors. Um, and 
the, the, the alacrity that you're proposing, the, the kind of um, lying behind your thought, the kind of um, speed with which we need to react and how we need to set up these competitive markets that you're talking about, or the competition between firms, or the learning system that we need to set up, is, uh, is, is daunting. How do you see that, or, or do you think I'm overreacting? No, I'm, I, I mean, I, I mean, the only thing I dis would disagree with is that there is some alternative which is easier to do. So, you know, I don't think, I mean, I think, you know, everything that um, is required to get development and growth going uh, requires a significant amount of bureaucratic capability and, and, ch and requires having a kind of a vision and a model that that you're you know you're, you're you're promoting so i think the first step is really to sort of you know have that vision you know we're all slaves of our um conception of uh, you know how the world works and if as you say you know we remain wedded to a 1970s or 1980s model of development you know and the, and the whole question of you know state capacity and effectiveness becomes uh, uh, really irrelevant. So the first thing is really to understand the world we're in and uh, what kind of a model um, we ought to be uh, promoting. So that uh, the vision thing, I think, is important. Uh, and and secondly, I think the question is how do you put the vision into into practice? So that's where the question of capacity and state effectiveness comes in. You know, I I, I don't think the the the, the kind of um, uh, you know, one thing we've learned about our, our usual sort of Washington consensus laundry list kind of reforms is that they too require significant, you know, uh, capacity. Um, and it's not just a matter of, of you know, borrowing, um, you know, some blueprint and borrowing some legislation from another country and just passing it. Uh, you know, so everything requires a certain amount of, of implementation capacity. Um, and, um, and and the type of of, of model I laid out uh, is not necessarily one that is more intensive in or that is more demanding of capacity because it, 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 it by its very nature uh, it's uh, it, it can you, you can start small and you can you know for example the model that even municipalities can begin to start doing this by organizing themselves uh, appropriately and coordinating their services is something they can start small. And, and so I think the, the question of capacity is, I think we're often, you know, sort of, um, you know, we, 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 you know, capacity is not something that you start out with. Capacity is something that is built over time. And the way you build capacity is actually by doing something uh, and learning. Um, and so I think the, the, uh, the, the, the right answer is to say, yeah, we lack capacity, but I think, you know, if this is our, our objective, this is how we're going to be uh, you know, um, uh, we're going to start doing and we'll build the capacity over time as we learn more how to do things better. So that's, you know, so, you know, that would be my, my, my answer. Thank you. One last question before I move on to the floor, Danny. Um, you know, I'm very heartened by what you said, because what we have researched and proposed for Pakistan is in line with what you're talking about. But we've also heard about today that agriculture is the path to development and we have to go down agriculture and we also hear about industrialization a la the old industrialization model with SEZ special economic zones and we are hoping that China will shift their industry here and we are hoping that we'll get Chinese firms to withdraw from China and come here so all kinds of trends are floating around but I, I see what you're saying and I agree with that reflect a little on Turkey I know you write a lot about Turkey and you have a Obviously, you are from Turkey, so you're involved with Turkey. How does what you say apply to Turkey? I think we can learn from that. Well, I mean, I think the, the main problem Turkey is facing right now is really, uh, I mean, I, I think the, the country right now as we speak is, is in the midst of a, of a currency crisis and the currency has just uh, plummeted uh, to, to levels that um, uh, would have been unthinkable of, um, you know, just, um, uh, a, a few months ago. Um, so, but behind that, I, I think there is a there's a deep uh, political crisis um, that's uh, the result of um, uh, a trend of um, uh, centralization and uh, um, increasing um, uh, um, uh, increasing authoritarianism uh, around a single man. And I think uh, 
the, the problem is is that unless that political problem is is resolved, um, it's very difficult to see how the economy can turn around. Um, so we have we're facing a very deep political problem in the sense that while Turkey is a nominal democracy uh, with regular elections, uh, we have a political leader who is very unlikely to lead office. Um, um, uh, through uh, um, uh, elections because the stakes for him personally are extremely high, so he cannot afford uh, to leave office. And unfortunately, that makes me very pessimistic about the, the, near, the near future of the country um, and uh, um, how we're going to turn the corner. Um, the, the big surprise about Turkey is how long it has lasted. And I think here, financial markets, especially global financial markets, have been extremely <laughs> permissive uh, of um, very uh, bad economic policies and, and very bad um, uh, economic management for a very long time. It's almost, you know, turns the usual argument on its head that we normally think about financial markets as essentially as a source of discipline on bad policy and bad governance. In the Turkish case, it's been exactly the opposite that if there was not been the, the long leash that financial markets had provided, uh, the sort of, you know, the, the almost endless um, uh, uh, inflow of resources from abroad because domestic inf you know, interest rates are higher than abroad, um, that, that I think um, many of these mistakes uh, would have um, not lasted for so long and that, you know, the, the economy would have turned around. Uh, in some sense, the crisis would have come sooner, but at also much lower cost. Uh, then it's going to come. Uh, it's going to be at the present. Thank you very much. Let me turn to the floor. Do you have time to take two or three questions? Uh, maybe just one round. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you, folks. Anybody? Any questions? Raise your hands quickly, and let's handle it quickly because Professor Roderick has to go. Go ahead, Safdar Sab. Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, this uh, transformation that you are talking about. Uh, requires two uh, important developments to take place in Pakistan. One is the uh, end of informalization. Uh, if uh, the government wants to help SMEs and services sector, now the situation of documentation is even worse than the manufacturing sector. So that uh, in itself uh, is extremely important. Our services sector in general is much less documented. The second is the state capacity. You've talked about the bureaucratic uh, capability. Now, Pakistan being a federation and domestic markets uh, are uh, more uh, kind of uh, local phenomena or then we have the provincial uh, government level. <clears throat> and the understanding of the competitiveness of domestic markets, local markets is very low, particularly at the local level. So when we imagine providing those public goods to SMEs, thinking of giving them wage support, et cetera, I think that, uh, that would require a big change. And there, I, I, the way I understand your <coughs> assertion that uh, growth policy is essentially social policy, I tend to think that civil service reform now actually is a social policy concern. Uh, in terms of uh, its capacity to do all that you have been doing. Thank you. Go ahead. Who else? I'll just collect three questions and come back to you. Okay, I have uh, one quick question. You mentioned about the manufacturing, uh, basically the capacity uh, for absorbing the labor force, and you said that it would be uh, no more there because of the uh, automation which is happening very quickly. But I think uh, we are talking about Industry 4, the technology will be there, but it still will take some time to take roots, you know, these Industry 4 technology in the industry. Uh, it's a phenomena which is evolving, which is happening. But uh, for the least developing countries in such situation, uh, what do you think, how much time or how much wind do we have to re-industrialize after de-industrialization? Uh, your opinion and your comment, please, on this uh, phenomenon. Uh, you know, th this uh, situation, please. Last question. Yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, my question is uh, about the demographics. Uh, you talked about the factor of production, the capital uh, versus the labor. Uh, 
we are living in a country where 64 percent is the youth bulge and it's our greatest asset but at the, at the same time it easily converts into greatest liability providing what we are really going to do with them so you, you also talked about india and philippines and the business processing out, outsourcing industry they 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 are doing a 20 25 billion dollar export from philippines and around 60 70 billion dollar exports from india we can easily replicate the kind of things which philippines and india has done here in pakistan considering the uh, huge youth strength which we have and the kind of technology which obviously not that high end it's already available here so Considering all the predicaments in the macro level, with the policy decision, the bureaucratic hurdles, so on and so forth. So how do you see uh, Pakistan as a young population and the kind of industrial or export uh, driven uh, uh, initiative it has, it has to take considering the uh, huge youth bulge it has? Okay, so what you your go. take on it? There you go, Danny. You've got three questions. Youth bulge. Um, civil service reform or capability, same thing that I was asking, and uh, the revival of industry, or should we revive industry? Yeah, thank you. These are um, you know, all terrific uh, questions. Um, maybe just um, uh, answering them um, in reverse order. I mean, I think the youth bulge is precisely what um, is, is what concerns me is is that. Um, is, is you know that's why I, I I said in one of my slides I think the central problem of development going forward is is where will the not where will the jobs come from where will the, where will the good jobs come from that is where will the relatively productive jobs come from uh, because you know you, you're not going to have unemployment but the issue is are you will you have enough productive employment um, and um, now I'm, I'm intrigued by the possibilities of perhaps BPO. Um, and similar tradable services um, creating significant employment. So what I would want to do there, and I don't have a, I don't have a very good answer. I sort of dismissed it in my remarks on the on the assumption that the skill requirements of expanding the BPO sector uh, and similar sectors in Pakistan and the, and the existing skills and education of the workforce that the gap is relatively large. Um, and therefore, that you know, that is not on its own going to be a, a significant uh, boost or significant solution. I may be wrong, so I think that's an empirical question of whether the education level um, uh, of the of the workforce is such that there is close correspondence between what's needed. If the answer is going to be yes, we can create a, a large and thriving BPO sector if we if we invest more in education and training and skills. That's always the answer. So education is always the answer for the future. The question is, what do we do for the youth bulge at present? And I think that's really what I'm concerned with. So we have to deal with the skills and, and the education of the for workforce we have, not the one that uh, we hope to have in the future. Uh, so that's, that's, but it's an empirical question. I think to the extent that there is a lot of uh, underemployment of relatively educated youths, I think uh, that's obviously um, a, a potential solution. Um, I think you know. I think the second question I interpreted as as being a question really about whether, you know, there is a window still for countries like Pakistan to significantly reindustrialize or industrialize, given that you know there is a lag between sort of um, you know the technological changes and the way that they sort of penetrate low, lower income countries. I think that window. I mean, I'm I'm sort of pessimistic because I think. You know that the world economy is now it's so globalized that you know it's not like it's very difficult for you to compete with uh, you know technology from the previous generation. If you're going to want to be part of global value chains, you're essentially going to be absorbing and using technology that's sort of very similar uh, to what most firms are producing in the advanced north because you have to produce to their quality standards, and that's going to be very difficult if you're using older technology. So I think there was a window for perhaps you know some earlier um, um, uh, industrializers. I think there was a window, for example, for Bangladesh, uh, which um, was very successful with ready-made gar garments and with very labor-intensive um, uh, um, production. But look at the policy debates in in Bangladesh to, today. Um, that you know it's every 
paper you read about you know the future of manufacturing in Bangladesh today is really how you know there's really no choice but to upgrade and what does upgrade mean upgrade means investing in automation and new technologies in other words absorbing the technologies uh, of, from the west that's going to create exactly the kind of of conundrum that i'm talking about with respect to uh, uh, job creation um, finally, I think um, uh, on, on, on informality, uh, I think that's a real issue. So I think I would say that there are two things I would look there. So one is you don't want your policy regime to be one that very that makes for uh, that makes entry into the formal sector. It makes formalization very, very uh, costly. So one thing is I would look at sort of are there really regulations or taxes or other requirements that's really keeping firms uh, informal. And so that's one broad set of things because you don't want to discourage formalization. Um, conditional on not explicitly discouraging formalization, then I think the way that I would think of my brand of providing services and, 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 and encouraging employment creation in the small and medium-sized enterprises is by essentially, uh, provi essentially presenting firms uh, including informal firms, with a kind of a quid pro quo. And it would be like, I'm willing to provide you with certain s services, including training your labor force, potentially providing you with some, you know, um, uh, um, uh, you know help with uh, technology or marketing or regulations or zoning. Uh, in return, however, you know, that, that you would have to, you know, for example, if you're informal, you would have to become a formal firm. Um, and, and so this is a way of, you know, uh, uh, pro presenting a set of incentives that have the right a set of, 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 of services that have the right incentive structure for firms, which is that the entrepreneurs or the informal firms that will want to enter this good pro quo uh, are the ones that see for themselves a certain future because that they will then incur the hopefully moderate cost of formalization. But in return, they're getting some benefits, some services from from the government, from or whatever local agency. Uh, so I think that kind of of, of um, you know quid pro quo, uh, where formalization doesn't simply look like it's a it's a kind of a stick. They have now they have to pay taxes. Now they have to be regulated. But also that in return, they're getting services. I think it might be a way also to. Um, uh, in the provision of these services, uh, you know, provide you know uh, provide appropriate selection incentives so that you don't want everybody to come in and queue up for these services. You want the ones that are more likely to invest in the right direction and have a vision for their firms and are more entrepreneurial, and those are the ones, in fact, more likely to want to accept that that quid pro quo that bargain. Professor Roderick, thank you very much. Um, as you can see, this is why we set the theme of this conference. The coming future is very difficult indeed, and we have to prepare for it. It's not going to be easy to follow Bangladesh, China, Vietnam. There's a lot of debate here on following China and Vietnam, and uh, the Chinese model, people talk about the Japanese model, but the world has changed. The reason I asked you about Turkey is we may more we may be more on the path of Turkey, sadly, and uh, as you are trying to struggle with the economy of Turkey. We are trying to struggle with the economy of Pakistan. Thank you very much, um, Professor Roderick. Um, we won't keep you now, although I've just got a message saying there are more questions waiting, but I know you're in a hurry. So thank you very much, and inshallah, we we'll look forward to having you in Pakistan. So now that COVID is over, our invitation is open to you. Please come and visit us, and hopefully we will get much more out of, we still always get much more out of you but we'd like to show you Pakistan and welcome you warmly to Pakistan as well. Thank you Professor Rodwig, thank you for always being there for Pakistan. Thank you very much and uh, uh, good luck for the rest of your conference and thanks again for, for having me. As you can Bye -bye. see there's a lot of appreciation in the hall. Thank you Professor Rodwig, all the best. Good night. Thanks.